Freddy vs. Jason, a crossover film between two legendary horror movie villains, Freddy Krueger of the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise and Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th series. They depicted two of the most relentless, sadistic killers you could probably imagine in Hollywood history. On one side, the mutilated dream demon in a Christmas sweater. And on the other side, an indestructible killing machine in a hockey mask. It's a horror fanatic's dream come true. These films were violent blockbusters. Gore glorified on screen like never before. In September 2004, just outside of London, England, there's one fan who will try to live out the film's murderous quest. I think that Daniel was trying to emulate the killer in Nightmare on Elm Street. He wanted to emulate Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees. And for two days, he does just that. <laughs> In 2003, the long-awaited showdown between two horror movie heavyweights is released. Freddy vs. Jason. Freddy Krueger. I mean, what could be scarier than his face? Then you notice he has this glove with all these straight razors attached to it, which doesn't really make you feel more comforted. Then there's Jason a kid who had a horrible childhood, and the only way he can figure out to kind of ease his pain is to take this incredibly long knife and just run people through with it. Teenagers across the country scream with delight as the two biggest movie franchise villains' body counts soar to epic numbers. This movie, Freddy vs. Jason, I think really unified two audiences, two groups of horror fans, and put them in the theater together. For most, this slasher film is just a fun adrenaline rush. But when one horror movie fan decides to take on his own twisted impersonation of the movie's two most gruesome villains, there will be real blood spilled. He actually told the police he wanted to know how it felt to be Freddy Krueger. And he made that happen. On September 17, 2004, 24-year-old horror film fan Daniel Gonzalez is brought into the London police station for suspicious behavior. When Gonzalez was arrested at the tube station, he was clearly distressed, he was buzzing, he was high, tried to use a blood-stained note uh, at the tube station. Clearly, if someone hands you a blood-stained um, note, there's something there that's not quite right. The police suspect the young man in custody may be linked to a brutal double murder earlier that day. When police brought Daniel Gonzalez in, they certainly were suspicious, but they didn't know for sure. This was just a 24-year-old who was acting strangely and was dressed strangely, clearly, with blood covering his body. Mr. Gonzalez, I guess we got a few things we want to talk about, don't we? What they don't know is that he has actually gone on this insane murder spree, this spontaneous, indiscriminate killing spree, believing that he is some kind of supervillain that is invincible. But soon, <laughs> detectives will realize the man they brought into custody is incredibly unpredictable and violent. Daniel Gonzalez hit one of the policemen right in the mouth what made the attack interesting is it was not provoked. The policeman was just walking him in, and then Daniel reached out and punched him with no impulse control, just did it. And then when, when the reaction happened, Daniel then apologized. So very quickly upon his arrest, the officers would have realized that he was dangerous. And this young man in custody truly is a real life horror movie killer. Even at a young age, Daniel's mother knew something was very wrong with her son. Daniel was someone who had a hard time growing up. He was having a difficult time maturing. He was having problems socializing. He was a bedwetter till age 12. 
he didn't really have any close age-appropriate friendships within his life. So always an individual who self-isolated. Always an individual who, who had problems making friends. But his problems go way beyond just having trouble making friends. Well, Gonzalez was a very, very complex young man. He was above average intelligence, certainly quite clever. But there was also a darker, complicated side to Daniel, mixed up with lots of propensity or thoughts and fantasies about violent action. Daniel Gonzalez also wrote dirty, offensive drawings on a textbook saying that I don't belong and I want to hurt, I want to damage, I want to make others suffer. He was shown potential to violence and deviant behavior way back when he was at school. He got into trouble with the school authorities when he was a young man, and that, that element of violence and unpredictability persisted throughout his later teens and early adulthood. At age 19, Daniel is finally diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a very, very serious mental health problem where an individual suffers from extreme difficulties in coping. They suffer from mood swings where sometimes they're incredibly low and flat and other times they can feel quite excited and elated and positive, almost manic to some extent. Living with his mother, Daniel spends most of his time alone. Daniel was a guy who never had a job, he never had a girlfriend. He had these potential mental health problems. He was isolated and he was alone. And eventually, that loneliness began to culminate into anger. Daniel, what are you watching? And it's noon. It's so dark in here. Don't, don't worry about it, Mom. It's, it's all right. Don't worry. His mother could see now? Gonzalez slowly unraveling. And some days, that unraveling was much more pronounced than others. His ideas and notions and fantasies of killing people or hurting himself had become more vocal and verbalized. Daniel, this is horrible. No. <laughs> That's all right. All that blood. Shh. Daniel, you shouldn't watch this. Hey. This is very disturbing. Oh, don't you have to go to work or something? He spent his time watching a lot of these fantasy horror movies, playing video games, because these things empower an individual. They make them feel like they're in control of their own lives and maybe even the lives of others. His two favorite characters are Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees. There is no doubt that Daniel Gonzalez was a fanatic of these Freddy and Jason films. This is the best part. No, please, change the channel. Ah, please. Most people see a villain like Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees, and they're repelled by it. They don't relate to the killer. They relate to potential victims. But Daniel, on the other hand, he feels a connection. So much so that after days upon days and hours upon hours of watching these films on repeat, Freddy begins to call out to him. Oh, Daniel. Paranoid schizophrenics have delusions, and they also can have hallucinations. They can hear voices that may be telling that individual to do bad things or to kill someone. So when he watched these movies, he got this sense of euphoria. And then he realized, hey, this is something I could do. Daniel's mother feels there is nothing she can do to get her son the help he needs. Daniel, who are you talking to? No one. One of the tragic things about the Gonzalez case is that his mother could see Gonzalez slowly unraveling. <laughs> the Daniel's mother knew that her son had problems. She wanted to get him help. And she even tried to get help from the British authorities. Are you OK? She had actually sent them a letter that quite ironically 
ask the question, does my son need to commit a murder just to get mental help? Fuck off, Mom! I'm fine! Then on September 15th, 2004, Daniel decides it's time to follow the voices in his head. <laughs> Daniel? That morning, he waits for his mother to leave for work. She has no idea the horrors her son is planning to inflict. Mom? Daniel picks his weapon of choice, one worthy of his horror film heroes. It's hard to ascertain if there was a plan that Gonzalez had in his mind for the killings that he was about to do, but he didn't have any fantasies about shooting or strangulation. He clearly wanted the high, visceral visual impact of an individual suffering right in front of him. Jason used a knife. Freddy Krueger had a, a bladed glove. So these blades signified something that he felt represented power. The same power that Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees have in the movie. Soon after, Daniel leaves the apartment in search of someone to kill. Daniel left the home and went to a park with the sole goal of stalking people that he thought would be appropriate to kill. Anyone, anyone who he came in contact with was possibly a potential victim. And he saw the Kings, a couple in their 60s who were out getting some exercise. At last, Daniel believes he's found his perfect targets. Daniel. Peter and Janice King were walking along, completely unsuspecting about what was going to befall them. The Kings were in the wrong place at the wrong time. These are people who were indiscriminate victims. There's no way they could have ever dreamed that a real-life movie monster much scarier than Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees is waiting to strike. He, he wants to feel how fearful they are of him. He wants to feel powerful, and this is the beginning. Hearing these... I think that Daniel was trying to emulate the killer in Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th. Freddy vs. Jason is a true-to-form slasher film that pays homage to two terrifying horror titans, Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees. Both Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th had a huge franchise of film. When Freddy vs. Jason came out, this was sort of an explosive marriage of the two coming together. For the first time, you have these two psychopathic villains not going after innocent victims, but going after one another. After horror fan Daniel Gonzalez is brought into the police station for questionable behavior, police learn about a series of crimes that may have been inspired by slasher legends Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees. That if you're a healthy, normal person, there's actually a comedic aspect to some of these movies because they are so ridiculous. And I think that any normal, healthy person would never take them seriously. But Daniel Gonzalez is far from a normal, healthy person. He's a diagnosed schizophrenic with homicidal thoughts. So a lot of individuals who suffer from extreme forms of schizophrenia sometimes suffer from what we call magical realism. They believe that inanimate objects are controlling them or that complete strangers on the TV are dictating what they should do. For Daniel, he claims that Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees are telling him to kill. Daniel. An order in which he plans to obey. Daniel Gonzalez was waiting and on the path that he had chosen was Peter and Janice King. Daniel jumps out and declares that he's going to kill the Kings. I'm gonna kill you! He 
literally puts his knife right under Peter King's throat as his wife is watching this. No! No! He does it because he wants to feel powerful and he wants to see the fear in their eyes. This, for him, is the fulfillment of a fantasy that he's possibly had for months, even years, and now he gets to do it for real. But Daniel isn't prepared for when Peter King fights back. Peter is able to wrestle him away and fight him away. And Daniel, even though he's the one holding the knife, he begins to flee. Sorry. I'm schizophrenic. He says, I'm sorry. Yeah, no. I'm schizophrenic. I can't help myself. <laughs> when Daniel's story ends, detectives can hardly believe their ears. So tell us what happened. What? Little do they realize that the bloody tale has only just begun. With a knife, and I just wanted to carve somebody up. Daniel's, quote, excuse for not being able to kill Peter King is that the knife he has is too small. After this failed attempt, Daniel tells police next time he was going to be better prepared. For him to leave that scene, beaten off, beaten away by two older people, one of them a female, meant he really had to go back and get a bigger knife. That's when Daniel tells police about a recent shopping trip, and his purchase has killer consequences. At the hardware store, Daniel buys a large knife a knife that is probably reminiscent of the kind of blade that Michael Myers carried in Halloween, the kind of knife that can inspire fear. And he decides to buy a hockey mask, just like in the movies. In this hockey mask, Daniel can truly transform himself into his horror movie idols. The particular mask that he used, of course, is synonymous with the Friday the 13th series and, and the Jason Voorhees character. And so now he's actually able to live out the identity of some of these supervillains that he himself considers to be heroes. And he is going to emulate them, and he is going to carry out these killings himself, not on a Hollywood screen, but in real life. Armed with his mask and a large knife, Daniel prepares himself to strike again. So two hours after he had attempted to murder Peter King, Daniel Gonzalez hid in a pathway. He puts on the mask, pulls out his knife, and waits. Then he spots his next victim. Marie Harding was walking down this secluded path. She was a 73-year-old retired school teacher. And on this day, she was coming back from visiting her daughter. There's no reason for her to suspect anything. He picked the elderly lady, Mrs. Harding, because she was alone, she was female, and he was able to approach her from behind. Having just lost his battle with the kings, maybe his confidence took a knock. Maybe he didn't feel able to kill someone as easily. So he picked an individual by herself. And behind the mask, his sick confidence grows. For Gonzalez, of course, wearing the mask gives him an added perspective. It actually emulates the perspective that Jason Voorhees had. So actually seeing his victims die from inside this mask will be a direct 100% emulation of those gory horror moments that he's fantasized over and watched countless times. Daniel Gonzalez jumped up, grabbed her, stabbed her in the back, and then slit her throat. 
73-year-old Marie Harding dies almost instantly in a senseless murder carried out by a homicidal maniac who is only just getting started. In Freddy vs. Jason, Freddy Krueger, the dream-stalking madman from the Nightmare on Elm Street series, resurrects Jason Voorhees, the machete-killing psycho from the Friday the 13th series, for an epic battle. Along the way, Jason and Freddy terrify a small town and leave a string of dead bodies in their wake. In real life, Daniel Gonzalez is also determined to leave a trail of bodies worthy of his horror movie idols. Now with Daniel Gonzalez, he clearly over-identified with these individuals. He identified with this predatory nature, with the goal of murder and killing. Daniel has just told police about his first terrifying kill. 73-year-old Marie Harding. And this is only the beginning of his bloody rampage. After Daniel slays Marie Harding, he decides he wants to take a break. He's had enough for one day. He decides he's going to go home. Once there, Daniel locks himself in his room, euphoric from the murder. When Daniel gets home after killing Marie Harding, one of the first things he does is he actually writes notes to himself. He's literally promising to himself that this is what he's going to do. For the first time in Daniel's mind, he actually has a job. Of the best things I've ever Later that evening, Daniel's unsuspecting mother returns home from work to find Daniel locked in his bedroom, talking Daniel? to himself. Who are you talking to? No one. On that night, she has no idea her son has done what she feared most. Based on his emotional instability, caused his mother a lot of stress and anxiety. Nothing worse than having a child who's mentally ill and you feel powerless. As the sun rises the next morning, so does this fledgling serial killer. The morning after murdering Marie Harding, Daniel goes on a beer drinking binge. Let me get a dark beer. He was celebrating and drank himself till he was intoxicated. He also sought out drugs. I mean, this drug cocktail is really playing a dangerous game with one's mind, let alone someone who's paranoid schizophrenic. For someone who has a serious mental illness, it can actually enhance the impact of the mental illness. So now those voices that Daniel is supposedly hearing may have been broadcast even louder. Hey, buddy, you can't do that in here. Come on, you're done. I'm not done. I'm not done. With the voice of Freddy Krueger taunting him in his drug-rattled mind, Daniel sets out looking for his next victim. He sees a pub that is closing. And he sees a man who is exiting the pub. Daniel's unsuspecting target is 46-year-old Kevin Malloy. Hey, buddy, you all right? Dude, you OK? Kevin Malloy is different than Daniel's previous victims. He's not elderly, and he's not small. You OK, dude? You all right? Although Malloy is bigger than Gonzalez, Malloy clearly had been drinking and wasn't in a, in a fit state to defend himself against a surprise attack. In the police station, Daniel tells police his head was going all mad, and he had to, quote, murder someone then. I was, I was hearing these voices in my head. The tragedy of Kevin was he didn't even know really what was going to happen. <laughs> And the shock of when he was first stabbed was to say, what are you doing? A question. 
that one would ask from one human being to the other. But all this did was provoke Daniel. He stabs him multiple times all over. He stabs him in the abdomen. He stabs him in the chest. He even stabs him in the face. With Kevin Malloy dead in a pool of blood, Daniel Gonzalez disappears into the night, ready to wreak havoc on the city. Daniel was no longer frightened. He may have originally wanted to attack elderly individuals that he could gain control over and kill quicker. But now he had progressed on either from drinking or the drugs or a combination of everything. He now was going after more able and more threatening victims. We're telling you to kill? Yes. They Police can hardly me. believe what Daniel does next. At this point, Daniel is on the prowl. He's on the hunt. He's looking for another job, so to say. I will be a serial killer. He wants to fulfill his promise to himself, and that means he has to kill as many people as he can. And his body count will continue to rise, and murders become even more brazen. Are you OK? No. Both The Nightmare on Elm Street and the Friday the 13th franchises play on audiences' anticipation that something horrible or unexpected can happen at any moment. Metaphorically, Jason or Freddy are always around the corner, ready to kill. Slasher films are very interesting because they provide an escape for the person watching them. There's something exciting and satisfying about seeing an individual screaming and yelling and begging for their life. But in Daniel Gonzalez's case, these movies are not just an escape. Daniel admitted that he had this need to kill. He wanted to feel powerful, and he wanted to be in control. And he did not see any other solutions to achieve that. He only saw the solution from what he was watching day in and day out, which were these slasher films. At this moment, Daniel Gonzalez is Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees in his own mind. Riding on the high of killing Kevin Malloy, Daniel tells police that he then took to the streets to find more victims. We don't know why he picked the house of the Constantinus, probably because of an access point, an easy way in. Middle-aged couple, Kumis and Kristala Constantinou are upstairs in their master bedroom, sound asleep. Daniel breaks into the window, but breaking into the window awakes the wife. Pumas, Pumas. What? Did you hear that? Hear what? In Gonzalez's attack, he followed that common trope of slasher films, the home invasion. He broke into their house in the, in, in the early morning, and the noise that created clearly woke up uh, Mr. Constantinou. I think it's Mother. Living out a real-life horror movie, Mr. Constantinou decides to go to investigate the strange noises downstairs. He comes downstairs. Right down there. Finds Daniel Gonzalez in his kitchen. Who are you? Holding a knife, ready to kill him. Oh, my god. Oh, no, oh, no. Very visceral battle. They were hitting each other. 
biting each other, scratching each other. Kumis' wife, Crystal, comes down the stairs. She's frantic. Get out! I got this bastard! And her husband then grabbed a cradle or chair and bashed it into Daniel's side. Daniel is wounded during the attack. Again, he realized he'd met his match, and he fleed the scene, just in the same way he was by the kings. Thankfully, Kumis and Kristala Constantinou managed to survive the brutal attack. You okay? Oh, I thought you were dead. Is he gone? Yes. With both his ego and his body bruised after the failed murder attempt, he makes a promise that the same won't happen with his next victims. Now that Daniel has attacked four people, committed two murders, he's looking for another job, so to say. That's when Daniel decides to tell police about his next round of kills. Derek and Gene Robinson are at home eating breakfast. Derek and Gene Robinson were wonderful people. He was a retired pediatric physician. She was a retired music teacher. They both spent their life giving and helping people. Like all his victims, the Robinsons were completely picked at random. Daniel Gonzalez came to their door covered with blood. They assumed, regardless that it was a stranger, that this person needed help. The Robinsons had no chance of survival from the moment Mr. Robinson opened the door. May I help you? Are you OK? No. A battle ensued straight away um, in the hallway, in the doorway of the property. Derek Robinson dies moments later. Gonzalez said once he'd killed Mr. Robinson, he almost felt sorry for Mrs. Robinson and wanted her to die very, very quickly. So he stabbed her chest and stabbed at her neck as quickly as he could to kill her as fast as he possibly could. Daniel has just murdered his fourth victim and attacked four others. So when the police are talking to Daniel, says, after he committed the murder, she said, I felt clean, I felt orgasmic. I washed all the crap out of my life. He has finally gotten a taste of revenge. He has finally had a sense of what it feels like to feel empowered. And this time, instead of immediately fleeing, he decides to stay at the scene of the crime. It's covered in blood. So he actually goes upstairs and takes a shower. Oh my God. And while Daniel is upstairs taking a shower, an interior decorator who has a set of keys that was scheduled to come by comes to the residence and sees the Robinsons laying dead on the ground. He hears a shower running upstairs. In shock, the decorator slowly heads towards the sound of the shower running. Literally something out of a real life horror film. The decorator either due to curiosity or stupidity, proceeds up the stairs to see who's about to take a shower. This man is literally about to come face to face with the devil. In Freddy vs. Jason, two movie monsters kill dozens of people before they decide to battle each other. Outside of the movie, Daniel Gonzalez is trying to match the film's body count after he hears one of the film's characters speak to him. And his next potential victim, an unsuspecting decorator, is heading right for him. He starts to go upstairs. And standing in front of him, he sees a completely exposed Daniel Gonzalez. 
Daniel has no mask, no knife. He's caught completely off guard. Daniel Gonzalez just looks at him calmly and says, sorry about this, mate. Sorry about that, mate. Daniel pushes past the stunned decorator, sparing his life. He's now escaped. He's committed his fourth murder and his sixth victim. He's covered in blood, but he's injured. Now out on the street in broad daylight, cut up and bleeding, Daniel takes a bus to a local medical center. Daniel Gonzalez goes to the hospital to get treated for his wounds. All right, what happened here? What's your name? Uh, Christian. Christian Linares. And he gives a fake name, so the hospital doesn't know. Nobody knows, and he gets his wounds treated. Daniel tells doctors he cut himself on broken glass. The blood on his clothing is his own. A lot of cuts here for a window. The doctors have no idea they are treating a homicidal maniac ready to strike at any moment. No questions are asked or the police are never called. He gets treated and he goes on. Like Freddy Krueger or Jason Voorhees, it seems nothing can stop Daniel Gonzalez's killing spree. Believing that he's essentially invincible because he's gone so many places now. No one has questioned him. No one has stopped him. No one has been able to stop him. Once again, out on the street, Daniel seeks out another victim. What he doesn't know is the police are looking for the killer of the Robinsons. So every policeman who's out on the street has their eyes peeled for their killer. Daniel just casually walks into the Tottenham Court Road tube station and asked to buy a ticket, covered in blood. Gonzalez tried to use a blood-stained note uh, at the tube station before he was arrested. Could be one of his bizarre ways of, of letting people know how bad he was or how evil he felt. Clearly, if someone hands you a blood-stained um, note, there's something there that's not quite right. The agent calls police, and Daniel is arrested in suspicion for the Robinson double murder. It's only after he's in custody do they realize the horrific truth about his killing spree. Once Daniel is detained, and he's brought to police headquarters for questioning, he doesn't take responsibility for his actions. He tries to blame it on the voices in his head. He talks about what a miserable life he's had, how he didn't really have any other option, and that this is what he was supposed to do. One of the inspectors who recalled the interview said that he found Daniel incredibly manipulative and deceptive. He wasn't buying it. Daniel, look at me. This note says you plan to kill 10 people or more. Is that correct? Who is telling you? I hear these voices in my head. They, they, they wanted me to do it. Daniel Gonzalez does admit to these murders, but he admits to them in his own way. He says, the voices were telling me to kill. And so I killed based on what the voices were saying. And he states that it wasn't first degree murder, but those four individuals were then manslaughter. Daniel is quickly dubbed the Freddy Krueger killer by the media. Ironically, these serial killers and spree killers often get what they want. They get it from the media because they want it to become famous. They become glorified. And to this day, Daniel Gonzalez is remembered as the Freddy Krueger killer. This was exactly what he wanted. So ironically, Daniel Gonzalez did get what he wants. He accomplished his objective. Daniel is brought to trial in February of 2006. Daniel's defense team tries desperately to convince the court that this is beyond his control, that this is not Daniel who committed these murders, 
This is someone else in his mind, that he can't appreciate the difference between right and wrong. But when you look at what Daniel did, and you look at the things that he said, not only to his victims, but to the police interrogators, admitting that this was something he had to do and something he wanted to do, it's very hard to believe that he didn't understand the difference between right and wrong. On March 16, 2006, Daniel received six life sentences for his murderous attacks of Marie Harding, Kevin Malloy, Jean and Derek Robinson, and the attempted murder of Peter King and Kumis and Cristal Constantinou. In the end, the jury agreed with the prosecution that Daniel Gonzalez was responsible for these four murders. And although he may have had mental health issues, they felt, first and foremost, he had a desire to kill, and he had free will, and he was responsible. The once terrifying serial killer is now confined to a padded room in a high security mental facility. He's sent to a psychiatric hospital. This is sort of the uh, supermax psychiatric institute. Daniel now suddenly has no freedom. He is completely under watch. Daniel Gonzalez is actually considered one of the hospital's most dangerous patients. And it's there where Daniel claims one last life. Daniel is not one for hard time. He no longer can watch his movies. He can no longer play video games. He can no longer go and escape into his fantasy world. Two years into his sentence, on August 9th, 2007, he manages to get a CD case, and he breaks it apart and uses one of the sharp edges to slash his wrists and take his own life, the final victim. In the end, the winner of Freddy and Jason's epic battle is left ambiguous. Jason emerges from the lake holding Freddy's severed head, which at the last moment winks and laughs. Unfortunately, like the movie, Daniel Gonzalez's notoriety will also live forever in infamy.